was always trying to write a, a good song, and like everything else, you put in your best effort, but you can't command the consequences. So it took a long time. The, uh, the song was written. I thought I think the song came out in in eighty three or eighty four, and then the only person who seemed to recognize the song was Dylan, and he was he was doing it in because nobody else recognized the song until quite a long time later, I think. When was Jeff Buckley's? In the ni in 92. In 93, 92, yeah. so it's almost uh, 10 years later. Uh, I, knew, I knew his father very well, Jeff Buckley, uh, incidentally. They're both, they're both fine young men, but, uh, um, and I think John Kill, whom I knew, Personally, he asked me for a for a bunch of lyrics, and I sent him a whole bunch of lyrics. And and I, where did he put it out? Is his in Shrek, or is that Rufus Wainwright's? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's. it's it, I think it's Rufus's. Yeah. In, in Shrek, it's Rufus's, yeah, or so. the, there, there there must. There, There's a John Cale one that's in a movie too, though. I think. Well, I think that I, I don't know about this, but anyways, they're both beautiful versions. I think. I think John Kills might be in the movie and Rufus is on the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. There was some curious distribution uh, uh, of the song between the, those two singers. Uh, but th they're both great singers. Uh, I've heard, I was in the room when, when Katie Lang sang it at the uh, Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. That, that really, that really touched me. You know when you're happy. You know, I think that's, there's, there's been so much talk about the mechanics of happiness, psychiatry and pills and, and positive thinking and uh, ideology, but uh, I really think that, that the mechanism is there. All you have to do is, is get quiet for a moment or two and you know, you know where you are. And for this knowing where you are, you don't need the help of anything like drugs or liquor or anything? Well. Uh, it's not a matter of the help. I mean, you can cooperate with the vision that alcohol gives you. You can cooperate with the vision that LSD gives you. I mean, all those things are just made out of plants, and uh, they're there for us, and I think we, we ought to use them. But also, there's another kind of high to get from refusing to use them. You know, there's all kinds of possibilities. Like asceticism is a nice high, too. Voluptuousness is a high. Alcohol is a high. It's a I mean, uh, town gets beautiful under alcohol. I, I get just kind of stupid and generally throw up. But uh, so, some people get really beautiful with alcohol. Do you see things in terms of highs and lows? Or is this just an appeal to sensation? Well, uh, I, I don't, I, it's not just a matter of sensation. What I mean by high is not a, a, a manic phase of, uh, of sort of uh, swinging swing, uh, knocking down buildings and laughing hysterically. I mean that, uh, that you're situated somehow. There's a, there's a nice balance, you know, that, uh, that you're in the center of your own orbit. Or as Dylan said, you fade into your own parade. There seems to be two schools of writers, the, the Flaubert school, where you work, you know, three months on a paragraph and, uh, you know, the Thomas Wolfe school where you write 40,000 words on the top of the refrigerator every night. Mm. Unfortunately, I'm in the former category and... Uh, and I'd be in the latter. I mean, I, I just, and the idea of working three months on one paragraph, or even writing and not, and, and being, and laboring over one paragraph before you move to the next paragraph, is, it's just, that's just painful to me. It's, it's a severe uh, enterprise and... Uh, but there is something that is uh, wonderful about finishing a song that you've labored on with that kind of uh, uh, care and intensity. You, you know that you, if you're going to be singing a song for the next 20 years, you want to be sure that you can get behind every word. And uh, I have a lot of songs that I can still get behind because I, I brought that kind of attention to the lyric. Because you knew what went into fashioning the words and the paragraph. Well, I, I, I have to write down everything that I throw away. So that by the time I get down to six verses in a song, maybe I've thrown away 60 or 70 completed songs. Mm. Uh, so the ratio is about 10 to 1. 
embrace that regime of uh, of a novel or a long prose work or a symphony or whatever it is. You know, it's I, I just love that regime. Getting up in the morning, having your coffee, and playing guitar for half an hour or so, then going to, going to the typewriter and uh, doing a quote every day. It just it just locates your whole day. Are you doing that now, by the way? Or no? Or will you shortly? I hope so. Does that depend on having sorted out the personal messes to the point where you can get a physical space and a and yeah. a, a daily routine of bread, butter, and yeah? I'm not so sure, so sure it involves sorting it out. I think you have to bite through, maybe just uh, establish yourself and begin the work, and then let the mess gather around it in, mm. in, in whatever way it does. Do you think it was I think that's what stops a lot of people from writing. You know, the, uh, a lot waiting of people, to sort it out. Yeah, waiting to sort it out. I don't think anything gets done. If only way. I had the time, I would. Yeah. Out of the thousands who are known or who want to be known as poets, maybe one or two are genuine, and the rest are fakes, hanging around the sacred precincts, trying to look like the real thing. Needless to say, I am one of the fakes, and this is my story. I am one of the fakes, and this is my story. That's right. <laughs> What's the difference for you between writing a poem and a song? A poem has a certain, uh, a, different, a different time. For instance, a, a poem uh, uh, is a very private experience, and it doesn't have a driving tempo. In other words, you know, you can go back and forward, you can uh, you can come back, you can linger, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a completely different time reference. Whereas a song, you know, you've got a tempo, you know, you've got something that is, is moving swiftly, you can't stop it, you know, and, it, and it's designed to move swiftly from, you know, mouth to mouth, heart to heart, where, where a poem really speaks to something that has no time. And that is, uh, uh, it's a complete, completely different, different perception. You talk about coming to terms with being a songwriter living in LA in quotes in one of the interviews that you did. And coming from you with successful novels and books of poetry behind you and movies and all the things that you have done, um, it was a very revealing kind of sentiment, kind of coming to terms with being a writer, a songwriter. Do you think that songwriting is an under-respected craft in North America? Mm, I don't know. Uh, uh, what I meant by that remark was that uh, I was in L.A. and I was a songwriter, and that there were no alibis. Uh, you know, I was too old to consider an alternate uh, career. I wasn't really going to be that forest ranger in Canada that I that I kept in the back of my mind. You know, I wasn't really going to be defending the uh, outcast uh, in courts as a lawyer, that uh, there was no longer any, any alibi. And uh, I was in LA trying to mix my record and, and having to begin again and start from scratch with many songs and many tracks. So that, uh, uh, that was just facing the music, so to speak. That's what I was. You talk about the kind of effort that goes into writing a song, filling a whole notebook with just one song or more than one notebook mm -hmm. in some cases, or banging your head against the floor of a, of a uh, hotel trying to find a word that rhymes with orange. I mean, one gets the image of, of uh, the difficulty in this craft. Do you, do you feel that like that is underappreciated by people? When you, when you wrote a great book, did you feel that it was revered? Uh, I, I don't think you can. I, 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 those have never been uh, elements in my expectation. I, I don't think people have to know uh, or care uh, about whether you worked a long time or not. Great songs are written in the back of taxi cabs. Uh, I, don't, I don't. I don't think it's um, the fact that you have to work hard is uh, just a fact. Uh, by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou earn thy bread. Um, They'd be nice if things came easy, and to some people they do, although not to very many. I think to bring a complex project to completion, as I observe my friends work, uh, the way my people I know uh, have to struggle, it seems to take a great effort. 
to bring anything to completion these days. This notion of talent and talentless is very interesting because, uh, you know, in Japan, I'm not holding Japan up as a, any kind of model, but just as an interesting phenomenon, there they don't have the notion that uh, you have to be a talented poet. You know, there they have this notion that everybody can make that kind of statement. You know, they're, 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 they're educated in a certain kind of emotional approach so that they can write their haikus about the first, like last night was the, the last rain, you know. In, uh, in, in Japan, like, the, like there are 10,000 poems written by just anybody at the, the night of the last Published. rain. Published? They, they publish a journal of 10,000 poems every year of just citizens who send this stuff in, you know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is what we must establish here or there. I'm just saying that this notion of what talent is, is, is like so many other things. It's a, it's a device of those who are dead to kill more. You know, there, there is, a, there is a, if you want to feel paranoid, there is a conspiracy of the dead to kill. And uh, one of the ways they do it is they invent this notion of talent or of right, who has the right to, to be a poet, you know, who has the right. And they give you all sorts of criteria. So a lot of people are, are you know, they, they see the regulations. They set up a whole series of regulations, you know, whether you qualify. Uh, this is done very subtly. So that uh, people growing up, you know, they get hit with these regulations by their literature teachers or by the radio or by whatever it is. And they say, oh, well, uh, you know, I don't qualify to be a poet. So I'll close off all these uh, possibilities, you know. I'm not good enough, or I don't feel deeply enough, or my vision isn't bright enough, or whatever it is. They find reasons for, for stopping. And those reasons are supplied and supported by a whole vast establishment that is much more serious than what we call the establishment. You know, I mean a real establishment of, of spirit killers. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm very... Um, you know, uh, suspicious of this thing of talent. Yes, there are great poets. You know, there are people who do, in some way, crystallize the emotions of huge masses of people. Or, but it, it should be open to so many more people. You know, it's just like the four minute mile. Do you know? Uh, uh, until Bannister ran the four minute mile, you know, nobody could run it. Everybody said it was impossible. And as soon as he broke that four minute mile, Many, many racers started breaking it. In other words, it was not a physical barrier. It was a, a mental barrier. And as soon as somebody broke it, everybody started running the mile in four minutes. So it's the same way with uh, many other things, you know. We have this notion that we can't do certain things. You know, we can't liberate ourselves. We can't do this. It's because, it's because you, there, there are people who want you to feel that way, people who fail themselves. You know, they want you to feel that you can't liberate yourself. So you have this notion, but as soon as you, you, you see a model of somebody who has, you know, then it becomes easier. Now it's very important to make those models available. When I started this uh, work and this racket, I, I always thought I was in for the long haul. And thought that you would be successful and, and would, would have a career. I never thought of it in terms of a career. I always wanted to be paid for my work, but I didn't want to work for pay. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. And you don't work for pay now. Well, uh, of course, it's an economic consideration. No, no, but, but I mean, the, the you're work, paid for your work. You don't yeah. work for pay, I and mean, you don't have to do this. Uh, you know, you the, there are certain private obsessions that uh, uh, really determine uh, what your life is, and uh, a lot of my life is concerned in turning out a certain standard of work. Mm. And uh, as long as I can keep up a respectable standard, I, I'm, I'm pleased. Money has a way of disappearing if you don't watch it very, very closely. Now, that's, that's a certain wisdom that I acquired. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't absolutely certain of this, but now I am. <laughs> So it's enough to put a dent in your mood.
Yes, because I, I mean, you had a manager and she disappeared with all, all your money. More or less, that's the story, yes. So you didn't have much left? No, no, I didn't. As a matter of fact, I was fast uh, approaching the situation when I would put my card in an ATM machine and nothing would come out. <laughs> and, and, and you still don't have much money. You don't have no, what you have. No, not too much. No, no. But, but you seem quite happy with it. It's yeah. not... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I mean, I don't recommend this as a spiritual exercise. <laughs> But if it does happen to you, a lot of a lot of very important uh, uh, information is uh, is delivered to your heart. For instance, uh, and I think that every parent would wait for this to happen. My son said to me, he said, "Dad, do whatever you have to do on the legal side to uh, you know take care of the situation." But he said, don't worry about us. We've had a good life and we can take care of ourselves. So. Um, Many wonderful, uh, uh, m much wonderful information came my way. My friends are gone, and my hair is gray, and I ache in the places where I used to play. <laughs> and I'm hungry for love, but I'm not coming on. I'm just paying my rent every day in the Tower of Song. I said to Hank Williams, how lonely does it get? Hank Williams hasn't answered me yet. But I hear him coughing all night long, a hundred floors above me in the Tower of Song. I was born like this. I had no choice. I was born with the gift of a golden voice. And 27 angels from the great beyond, they tied me to this table right here in the Tower of Song. So you can stick your little pins in that voodoo doll. I'm very sorry, baby. Doesn't look like me at all. I'm standing by the window where the light is strong. They don't let a woman kill you in the Tower of Song. <laughs> now you can say that I've grown bitter, but of this you may be sure. The rich have got their channels in the bedrooms of the poor, and there's a mighty judgment coming. But I may be wrong. You see, you hear these funny voices in the Tower of Song. So I bid you farewell. I don't know when I'll be back. They're moving us tomorrow to that tower down the track. But you'll be hearing from me, baby. Long after I'm gone, I'll be speaking to you sweetly from my window in the Tower of Song. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>